Laser. <laughs> okay, we are now recording. Okay, so for posterity, we are the Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee. Uh, we were organized to guide the town in meeting its climate mitigation and resilience goals. And those goals and the plan for getting there are adopted from the Climate Action Adaptation and Resilience Plan, or CARP, which was accepted by the town council in 2021. Taking 2016 as its base year, the CARP calls for a 25% reduction in carbon emissions by 2025, 50% by 2030, and carbon neutrality by 2050. So this committee has two primary functions, one to advise the town council and recommend or propose policies or actions to help us meet those goals, and two, to promote a just, equitable, and speedy climate response through outreach and engagement of town and local, to town and local stakeholders. So with that, that statement, <laughs> let's get started with our agenda. Uh, first, the first um, item on the agenda is always to review the minutes from last time. And I can share those. Let me just pull this up here. You guys there and Lori, we need a minute taker. Oh, right. We need a minute taker. And Michael did it last time. Michael did it last time. Going down the list, Tony's not here. I'm excusing myself. So Dwayne, you want to do it again? Uh yes, I can do it. Um okay. I'm just uh dealing with a little computer issue with accessing my files, but I should be on it momentarily. You sure? Because I can just go down the list again. No, I can I can uh right. Yeah, just the circles going around and not stopping, but I think I should I should get to my files momentarily. Oh, All right. So I will meanwhile bring up the ECAC minutes to share. I'll make them a little bigger. You that big. You guys get back over here. See everyone. All right. And Thank you so much. These are our minutes. Thank you so much. Coffee has been delivered. It's been delivered. No, I like Thanks. the shade. I'm, Very on, nice. I'm online. Fits perfectly. I'm in a meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, Hello. Sorry. Okay. So, um, meetings, review, minutes. Um, so I didn't see anything in here to object to. They were pretty, um, I didn't see anything to change. Looking forward to getting that list. We didn't get that list from Tony yet, did we? Okay, looking forward to getting that list. Resilient schools. Anything here? Anytime anyone wants to move to accept them as they are, go ahead. Otherwise, I'll keep scrolling through. If I'm going too fast or too slow, let me know. Anyone want to move to accept? Oh, there's the end. Hold on, just a little bit more. I was just waiting for the end to come. Okay. <clears throat> waiting for the end. Yes. There it is. I, I move to accept the minutes as they are. I'll second it. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Hey, and if you could please be sure to unmute in no particular order, Goldner. Yes. Steve Roof? Yes. Gregor? Yes. Selman? Abstain. Allison? Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Okay, sorry, that was an abstain from uh, From Selman. Jesse, yes. Yeah. Great. Okay, and continuing on, I think our next item is always public comment. And I see Martha's here. Nice to meet Martha at the Sustainability Festival. 
Um, do you have a comment? Just raise your hand if you do. Uh, I would just, I'll just say I was I was happy to meet people at uh, last week at the sustainability table. Uh, so to some people, I'm just no longer this uh, incoherent voice in the distance, right? I have a face. <laughs> so thank you. Welcome, Martha. Good to see you there. Very coherent voice, Martha. Yes. And I recognize Martha's voice. <laughs> uh, all right. So... Um, after that, let's go ahead through education and outreach. So we have, again, our two um, areas of um, impact, I hope, are education and outreach and advisory and support. Um, so education and outreach, we have a few things we've been tracking. One of them is this PACE program. And Don, do you have any updates for us? I don't. Um, I'm kind of discombobulated. I literally ran into this hotel room right when I signed on. It's, it's, yeah, I, I don't. Um, I did touch base with Stephanie. Um, and at the next meeting, I will at least have a discussion of any, any changes or differences in the new regs vis-a-vis um, -vis the old regs. Okay, so that would actually be really useful to get a little bit of a reminder of what the PACE program is and that sort of thing for our new members, especially. Sure who are unfortunately not here today, but hopefully they'll be here next time. So that works out well. Great. Um, okay, and Tony's not here today, so we'll skip B. Uh, heat pumps, we do have an update, which is that uh, I got, so Stephanie sent me a copy of the updated RFP um, a day or two ago. I still haven't looked at it. I will look at it and get back to you, but I don't expect if, if it's, we talked about a little bit at the sustainability fair, maybe you can tell folks a little about the change, Stephanie, but I don't have any um, objection to the change that we discussed. So why don't you, you want to talk about it a little bit? I was going to save that for staff updates, and I thought you were going to maybe talk more about the uh, programs, and oh, I didn't okay. know if you had an update on those. Uh, you mean on the... Um, Trainings. Trainings. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that has changed since the RFP uh, was first discussed is that there are now all of these free heat pump coach trainings out there. Um, so the original RFP called for the person who responded to the RFP to have a training program, but that's probably not necessary anymore because of Rewiring America, which is ramping up to do thousands. I mean, they, they have lots of slots open and they're ramping up to do thousands of trainings. Um, for free and Heat Smart Alliance, which honestly I think uh, is an even better training that is local and directed at Massachusetts um, rebates and Massachusetts um, concerns in particular. So I think between those two, um, that's a really uh, good thing to have. I've also signed up myself to be a heat pump coach through Heat Smart Alliance. So I expect they'll start sending me clients sometime this summer. <laughs> um, We'll see what happens. And I also should say that there is really, I mean, I sat in that booth at the sustainability fair. I'll share pictures later um, when we do the overview of the festival. And I had, uh, I, I couldn't get away to take a break hardly all day. I had to sort of sneak away. <laughs> um, there were, you know, people at point, some points lined up to ask questions and lots of really good questions, uh, some of which I couldn't answer and I'm still following up on. So there is a real need for this. Um, I'm not sure what else to follow up on there. It's, uh, Stephanie, you also took the, both the trainings that I took. So you have some insight on it as well. Yeah, I took them. They're very involved. I, I don't think I'm going to go as far as, um, certification, I think I was more interested in taking it to get the information so that I could sort of support on the on the back end for the town's efforts. Right. But um it's they're really I think they're great. I think they're really a lot there's a lot of information. Um and it can be overwhelming, mm -hmm. but my sense is that with each iteration of the program 
as they move into the next opportunity, they're they're tweaking it and refining it based on feedback. Both programs are. So I think that's really useful and helpful. And I haven't submitted mine quite yet, but I will because I definitely had some thoughts mm -hmm. that I wanted to share with them. But overall, they're really wonderful opportunities. Yeah, really interesting. And I thought, well done courses. So I'm, I'm, uh, I have a lot of nice tools that I didn't have before. I've actually put together a little web page for myself on my blog um, that just lists all of the different tools that are available and websites that are useful. Um, I mean, even Stephanie, I noticed you mentioned in the, uh, and, and then Dwayne, Dwayne, I see you go ahead and Dwayne has a question. Go ahead. Or a comment. No, finish your thought. It was a, it's a side question. I'm sorry. And I thought Jesse had his hand up. And Jesse had. Oh, his Jesse does too. First. Sorry. Go ahead. Why don't we do that? Go ahead, Jesse. No, fin finish what you're saying. I, I just, I like um, to have a follow up question. Yeah, I was going to say that, that one of the things that, that came out of this, for example, that, that Stephanie noticed and wrote into the RFP, why this is useful to everybody or to, you know, to us in particular, I think, um, was that uh, HeatSmart made the point that you don't always want to do the um, weatherization before you put in a heat pump system because you might want to put something in the attic. And if you've got 17 inches of cellulose in the attic, you're not going to be putting anything in there. <laughs> So, uh, you know, the, there's a right way to do this. And um, that got originally, the weatherization was first in the RFP. And now it's, I think Stephanie has left some leeway for it to be done either way. Although unfortunately, mass save requires the weatherization to be done first. So uh, it's a little bit confusing. Maybe they'll change their rule on that. So that's what I was gonna say. So Jesse, go ahead. Um, well, my understanding is those efforts, whether it be weatherization or actual, um, you know, envelope retrofit and mechanical systems would have to be thought about together holistically or else you're going to get yourself in trouble. Right. Um, I'm curious, what were, if you could just give a quick, what were some of the questions that people were asking, like, what is the, what's the, what's the pulse of, of folks? Um, okay. Um, were there any themes, for example? Oh, there were, well, the biggest theme was just, where do I start? What, what, what's the difference between, is, is a ducted system a, money, a heat pump too, or is that something different? You know, the people didn't know the difference between ducted systems and mini splits and didn't understand that they were both heat pumps. So they don't really understand what's being proposed to them. They don't know where to go to get good advice on what was being offered. Uh, one woman was worried because they realized sort of too late that they'd only talked to one, um, they had mass save in and then they had one company in and they accepted their offer, their, their, their um, uh, was it proposal without checking with anybody else. And I actually went and looked in the database for it to see what they had proposed and it actually looked reasonable to me. So that put her mind at ease a little bit <laughs> because, because you do get very different and weird, you know, depending on, she was using a company that I hadn't heard of. So I gave a lot of referrals to three or four different, without any prejudice, you know, local companies that I know do good work. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I also, so a lot of it was just generic. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> what, what am I, you know, who do I talk to? So referrals to Heat Smart Alliance for coaches or to Mass Save. Some people didn't know that you had to start with Mass Save to get the rebates. Um, a lot of it was generic stuff like that. And then there were three or four really interesting questions that I need to know the answer for. One of them was a low income person with a tiny house who just wants to replace their oil with, with a heat pump and has no cash. And so they wanna know, how do I do this? And um, I'm working on that because it's not obvious from the Mass Save site. In fact, one of my things to do today that I didn't do was to call Mass Save. Um, <laughs> the other thing uh, was uh, complaints about dandelion geothermal, which, as you may recall, we talked about here at least once because everybody was getting spammed with dandelion ads, and I was a little concerned about that. Um, they are doing a lot of work. They have a good idea and a good product, but it seems to me they're doing too much too fast, and they don't have any support. They don't have any um, customer support. So if they mess up, you're in a hole. So there's a woman who lives in downtown Amherst uh, using Dandelion who is not happy with the result and is not getting, it doesn't have a system that works reliably and is having trouble getting them to respond. Um, and the third interesting thing was about uh, 
uh, what was it? It was a tiny house geothermal. There was one other question I didn't know the answer to. Um, and I can't think of what it was right now, but there were three outstanding things that were interesting and that, you know, not uncommon, I think, like the geothermal and the, you know, a lot of people are using dandelion and a lot of people are low income. Um, so trying to get those questions answered. I, I took notes on all 15 people I spoke with, so I could go through it in gory detail, but I won't. <laughs> so Don, did, did that actually- Yeah, no, I just, our experience was, this is in response to your mass save and having to put your cellulose in before you, I, when, the company we were working with, they advised us that mass save will let you do it within six months. Oh, of okay. the installation of the system. Okay. So good. yeah, you get Maybe it. You, that's get, not a you get you get time. Yeah. Good. Maybe that's not a problem then. Um uh yeah. I'm not right. sure where my hand went, but um oh sorry uh, than here, but <laughs> um I just what, one question I had for you, Lori, is in your training and in the and in these oh, trainings, sorry. are they sp uh um focused uh solely on on air source heat pumps or do you get into geo geo uh geothermal or, or ground source heat pumps as well and and if if you do get into geothermal at all is it primarily residential or is there some uh, do you have some expertise or training on larger larger scale yeah. it's all residential, and, all residential yeah. and there's some training on it more in the rewiring america than in the um heat smart alliance um, but you are given in heat smart, they give you a bunch of tools to figure, you know, to, to look stuff up on your, on your own, if you want. So, um, I don't feel like my geothermal background is that great. Okay. <laughs> I, I just rate, ask it for a comment I'll make later. Yeah. In fact, oh, that was the other thing that I didn't know, a uh, big one, which is hydronics. I had thought that a geothermal system could do, could, 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 run a 180 degree uh radiator system but apparently not and not 180 uh, degree yeah not yet no okay not even 165 yet because that was something i thought i heard but i guess not okay so somebody was asking about that they claim they have a radiant heat that uses 90 degrees so not that hot um yeah that's typical low temp is is but they, they said they couldn't they low couldn't temp. Yeah, they said they couldn't get a geothermal to do that, and they ought to be able to get an air source heat pump to do that. So I'm a little confused about why they can't swap. In. Is there is there anything about air to water? Uh, that's what I meant, air to water. Uh, they ought to be able to get an air to water or an air to air, or a ground source air uh, to water, ground to water, but um, water to water, I guess, uh, to do that. But I don't I don't know why they're not. There are interestingly there are. So I looked this up afterwards, and this is fascinating to me. There is a Mitsubishi system now um, that does 170. It's enough to, to replace. It's 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 there. Uh, I it's, I can't. I'll find. I can send it to anyone who's interested. But it's being marketed in Europe, and it could be a drop in for a hydronic system. It's uh, it runs on propane. Um, or R. 202 or something like that, 220, I forget. It's it's the refrigerant is propane. Um, and it's a drop-in. And uh, it just needs to be available here. Mitsubishi has it. There's a couple other uh, American makers that are working on it. But um, it's already being used in Europe. So why not here? Now, Europe mostly uses lower temperature stuff, but they do have, I guess in Britain, they have, um, it's in the UK, I saw it being marketed. So it gets up to 170 or 175, which is hot enough. That's that's hot. Yep. Um, <laughs> the other one Mitsubishi for a little while had was a uh, one with the CO2 as yeah. the refrigerant, yep. which to me seems it's a funny trade off when you go to high pressure but yep. low GWP. Um, yep. Yeah, CO2 is also, there are a couple of companies developing that, and there is a, there is a hot water heater, uh, just a water heater available, um, that CO2, that I actually looked into getting, but nobody wants to install it that I can find, nobody so far. And we've, the problem, done a bunch yeah. of, we've done a bunch of them. I wouldn't, I yeah. would pace yourself on that. 
You have? Okay. I'd love to talk to you about that sometime because I understand the, the well, let's talk about it sometime. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, at any rate, there's a, and they're also, I mean, even the, the propane and the CO2 have uh, in common that they're going to be split systems, right? Because the, the, all the refrigerant has to be outside. It all has to be outside. Um, none of it can be in the house because it's either CO2 or propane. So you can't run a refrigerant line into the house, um, which is a little different than some of the systems run now, right? Some of the ducted systems or, anyway. Hmm. Um, how, how, how do you get the heat or cool into the house if you can't run those refrigerants? Get the transfer. Uh, exchange fluid. You're using, you're using water or, or polyethylene glycol as an exchange fluid. A lot of them are for hydronic systems, right? Or hot water heaters. Oh, okay. So they're split. So that, that, that exchange system stays yeah. outside. Yeah. And the advantage of a split for a hot water system, I mean, the problem I'm having, I'm looking at doing this right now, right? And that everybody has is I have a finished basement. I don't want to put a heat pump water heater in my basement. That's where all my instruments are. I can't get cold in there, right? <laughs> I have a little utility closet and I can't afford to be putting a heat pump inside the house, dumping cold air. So I have to get a split or I have to get something that dumps the cold air outside. Um, and right now that's the latter is what I'm looking at because it's cheaper. <laughs> but I want to be convinced that it really works. And that it's well, not there's, there's plenty that, that have a ducted exhaust. Yep. That's what I'm looking at is a ream with a ducted exhaust. So at any rate, Steve, you installed your own. <laughs> I, I did. It's it's a standard um heat pump domestic water heater. And I, I installed that. It's downstream of a solar thermal system, so oh, I get okay. get heat from the sun, and that heats up a solar tank, yep. a pretty big solar tank, and um, and then the the heat pump system boosts the temperature as needed. Right. It works pretty well, though. If we have too many baths and dishwashing, then uh, I've got it set fairly low temperature and on heat pump mode only. Uh, we could run out of water. Uh, hot water at, at the end of the evening. I'm the last person taking a shower, it might be lukewarm. Oops. Which, which I'll throw out there. That seems like a good thing. Yes, <laughs> I, I agree. But I think part, I'm I'm always anxious to hear these conversations track with very little about load reduction and cultural shift. And <laughs> I feel like I am need to kind of shake that bell every single time and. We also have a hot water system at our house that runs out of hot water, and my family doesn't appreciate it, but I do. <laughs> you don't Is run out of hot water, you run out of shower. <laughs> right, right. Is there a race to uh, who gets to shower first? <laughs> Early shower. <laughs> you know, it's it's a race, maybe a an argument. It, it could be anything. Ah, yeah. Yeah, the thing I would like now is for my dishwasher, it, it's supposed to have a delayed start feature, but that stopped working. And oh. It'd be nice if I could set that to start two or three hours after I take a shower and go to bed. And, Mine and, plugs and, in under the sink, so I could conceivably put a timer on it, I guess, so it wouldn't start itself. That wouldn't work. Right. Newer yeah, newer ones, I, I think it's a pretty standard feature, and it, yeah. Yeah. that part of the circuit board doesn't work on mine, but... Well, we get by. All right, so I think we've we've probably you can see where all this goes. I mean, this is this is if there's anybody out there who listens to this later who is interested in heat pump coaching, there is an enormous need for this. It was really clear at the sustainability festival that there are a lot of people who want to know how to do this and get it right. Um, so it's uh, it's something that's that's needed right now. And I'll get and I'll just again. I apologize. I'll jump on the semantics of it. It's carbon emissions co reduction coaching. Right, right. I don't want to pretend that, that that's a silver bullet. It just right. has to be coupled with a lot of other thoughtful yep. thing things. So that's one of yeah, harping. That, right. That, that's one of the differences between the rewiring and the Heat Smart Alliance. Heat Smart really is focused on heat. Um, and they do call themselves heat pump coaches. Rewiring America prefers the term electrification coaches, but then they discovered that most people don't know what that means, 
but they do know what fossil fuel reduction means. <laughs> so it's a, you know, the semantics are always interesting to think about. Fossil, fossil, getting rid of fossil fuels is something people understand. Um, Lori, will there be ongoing training so that you'll be uh, up to date on the yeah. latest technology? Is that part yeah, of that? and that's I have actually so so Heat Smart Alliance has a Discord, a uh, Slack channel rather, and they also have some working groups. I've already joined a technology working group. I find it fascinating in a weird way, <laughs> in a nerdy way, um, and they also have uh, they have other working groups for ongoing education, and they do do a more advanced. I think they do more advanced trainings very very specific they bring people in for speakers they have a they have an, a monthly meeting on friday mornings at 7 30 a.m um and they sometimes have speakers and this sort of thing um but i think they do all sorts of internal i, I haven't yet i'm not privy yet to the internal workings because i just joined the slack channel but i'm really impressed at, there was an enormous amount of information about the technology behind um a dandelion for example which is a google spinoff incidentally so <laughs> So there's a lot, some of it I don't even understand. So I'm going to have to go look it up and figure out what they're talking about. Um, there's a lot of, of techy, geeky, nerdy stuff on there about how the technology works and people keeping up on things. Um, CO2 heat pumps, I think, are in there somewhere too. So could you, Lori, could you make this a four credit class at the high school as well? <laughs> I, you know, I'm I'm actually going to teach a um, a uh, first year seminar at at UMass next year entitled "Kicking the Fossil Fuel Habit." You know how to help you and your friends. So I forget the whole title, but it's basically "Kicking the Fossil Fuel Habit," and I intend to use a lot of the material from from the Rewiring America in particular in that course. So it's just a once a week seminar. It's just the right, you know, 13 one hour uh, meetings. I think it's just about right <laughs> to get through a lot of this material and the physics, a little bit of the physics behind it too while we're at it. <laughs> so, all right, we should probably move on. Um, advisory and support, rental building, getting on to the next, oh wait, hold on, climate resilient schools. I don't have an update there, so that's quick. I keep meaning to check in on the Discord channel and see how things are going, and I, I haven't heard anything, but I did talk to Sunrise uh, at the Sustainability Festival, who's in contact with the uh, Climate Resilient Schools folks, and they haven't, I think they get the feeling they haven't been very active lately, so I don't think I've missed anything, but I'm going to keep my ears open for that one. So Sarah Ross is going to be speaking at the White House on Friday. What? Um, uh, can, she's the moderator for a panel on this topic and wow i think i i don't know no wonder how they haven't been busy here <laughs> so i think that would be a you know as 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 she's a amherst person and i think it would be great if any of us can watch that and 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 you know we'll if you see that you'll learn a lot of what's going on other places in the country and um and how it's being framed at a national level so i think that'd be a really interesting i have no idea how to connect to that broadcast if it is a broadcast um so but i think that's um, something that i can reach pursuing. out to her and see if she can provide a link or or at least yeah. suggest where we can access that, that so i'm be, happy to, i'm happy to do that, that i'd like to watch like it very, actually that's yeah, on friday too. this week i think so wow yeah, I would love to see that. I would love to see that. You know, this gets back to that question that you asked me at the uh, retreat, uh, which is, what would I ask the president if I were right there? Uh, and I just, I just don't know because there's so many things. I don't know how I could make a difference. But here's a kid who's got a. The people I know who have done that, who have made a difference, are the ones who have a single thing they're focused on at which they are the experts, right? I have a friend who who was into uh, you know sexual trafficking of minors and and she got to speak with President Obama. It was a big deal, and she made a real difference in that conversation. And Sarah Ross has, you know, her thing. Don't think Joe Joe Biden. I don't think Joe, Joe Biden, Biden is going to be at this one. I think it's the it's oh. the more direct. It's 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 at the White House, but I think it's not. Oh, that's like Kamala good. and Joe are are out. Um, ah, got something coming up in no. Something coming up in November that they're okay. getting ready for. Um, huh. I think it's, it sounds like a really great event, and I think particularly that it's a 
like a uh, discussion, like a like a there's a, a moderated discussion with a bunch of case studies and stuff. I think yeah. it sounds like it's gonna be wonderful. Right, right, right. Huh. That's going to be cool. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, so onward from there then, advisory and support. So we, we talked a little bit about the rental bylaw last time. Steve, where did we leave that? Do we have anything else to discuss today? Um, I did send to Stephanie the list of questions that we had come up with a year or two ago to put on the rental property registration permit permit registration application um that was a list that jesse helm a couple of years ago at one point it was in the draft bylaw it was removed um but what we what i believe i understand now is that the uh, permitting group would be creating that permit application and they are deciding will be deciding what questions to ask so i forwarded that to stephanie and she can tell us i guess if if it's gone anywhere Nowhere yet. Uh, hopefully right. I'll have an update at the next meeting. So one of the things that came up at the sustainability fair uh, was uh, Aaron Baker, who runs the um, Energy Technology, uh, in, oh, sorry, Energy Transition Institute, which is mostly about research. Um, uh, she mentioned, though, that there's a researcher, Prashant Chinoy, who I think I met. I know him, yeah. Yeah, I figured you'd know him, Dwayne, that, that he gets a lot of information about types of heating systems and even age, I think, uh, or certainly efficiency from available databases. He does a lot of work with databases. So he thought that with no reporting necessary, it might be possible for us to get a lot of information about our housing stock. Dwayne, do you know anything about that? Um, sorry, yep, yeah. uh, well, uh, Prashant's a, a computer scientist, um, and uh, one of the areas that he's worked on is um, very in close cooperation, collaboration with Holyoke Gas and Electric, uh, which is a situation we don't have here, which is a, you know, they're a municipal light district. They have shared data, uh, very um, granular metered data uh, with Prashant under some agreement uh, whereby he can use his computer science wizardry to um, basically detect at, at the household level when specific, uh, 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 noting different signatures of different appliances, how they turn off and on. He can tell when appliances, specific appliances are coming off and on in a specific household. And he's used that in a very aggregate way to help sort of understand how Holio could manage grow, uh, load uh, across the um, across their region. Um, I don't really think um, that's replicable um, to, to Amherst necessarily um, because we don't have access to that type of data from the utility company. Right. Okay. Okay. So we yeah. were working out of two data sets a couple of years ago, and one of the data sets was the property cards mm -hmm. and that lists property by the parcel ID and has some information about the age of the building and the square footage and sometimes the heating system, but oftentimes it's incorrect. Mm -hmm. or really incorrect. wrong. In my case, it's two, two renovations ago. Right. It really <laughs> depends on how whether a permit was pulled and how well the, the, the details of the permit work were recorded in the property card. Right. Um, and we and then we tried to match that to the rental property list, which uses a different identifier number um, and just wasn't we weren't coming up with anything that was uh, had any confidence in and being accurate. So the best way would be for direct questions, particularly for the rentals um, through the permit um, application process. That would be the cleanest and most direct way, assuming we get people answering those and the data yeah. get collected and, and a, you know, maybe after a couple cycles of permits, um, you know, there may be a decent data set there. Yeah. Okay. I, th I think though there's progress could be made with, without necessarily having that information. It's pretty easy to assume that a lot of rental properties 
need efficiency upgrades and probably have old heating systems and very yeah. little insulation. Um, the other thing we did at the sustainability fair is to try to collect names. We, one of the first people who approached me <laughs> uh, started immediately complaining about, it was actually 10 minutes before the fair started, um, <laughs> about the horrible condition of their rental prop or the rental yeah. property that they're in. And uh, I guess I won't name it here on air, um, but uh, it was bad and it had uh, single pane windows and and um, uh, oil heat, I think, and um, no, electric baseboard, sorry. This was the electric baseboard nice. place. Electric baseboard, mm -hmm. single pane windows, no insulation, and the landlord insisted that they keep, that all the tenants keep the heat at 55 or above to prevent the uninsulated pipes from freezing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the tenants pay for it. And the tenants pay for it, right. Um, so it's, it's bad. And, um, you know, there were a couple of other places that were mentioned as well. And I, I have the information on where those are. So we could start reaching out, you know, directly to places like that uh, without having to wait for a rental bylaw just to see if we can get anybody interested in maybe the thing to do is to look for what money is available, put a package, put a whole spiel together about what they could get if they were to do this um, and then uh, try to get them interested. Um, yep. Hmm? yep, go ahead, Wayne. I mean, just bring up another approach. I think I mentioned it many, 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 many meetings ago, but, um, and I don't uh, it, it know how it would work necessarily, but it seems like another approach to motivate these building owners um, is to make these situations more transparent. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm envisioning, you know, how, uh, I mean, social media is available now and people are constantly um, uh, evaluating restaurants and the best cookie, cookie, best cookies in Amherst or whatever. And, you know, I could see, I think it's Yelp or whatever, yep. uh, you know, some, some act action group, I'm thinking of Sunrise or some youth or group, um, uh, through some social media, local social media to, and some platform to allow for tenants to um, provide this data. Uh, you know, obviously it's not going to be science, scientific or, or all the, the data you need, but just like, uh, are you paying for your heat? How much are you paying? Uh, do you know what the fuel type is? Uh, are you cold? Uh, or just, you know, some evaluation of how utilities are working in that uh, in that rental property. Uh, and then people, you know, who are looking to rent that property can look that up and see what the uh, story is. Um, and, um, uh, and, uh, that could motivate property owners to, uh, um, update. Yeah. I just discovered, I was thinking, boy, this is sort of like rate my professor, right? That <laughs> great. My, great my landlord. landlord. Well, there is a site called rate my landlord. <laughs> well, can, you need there's the an app for that <laughs> okay can you, can you need the landlord's name or the management company's name but it's not finding much in our area at any rate that that's what we need right we need a we need a rent my rate my landlord um <laughs> all right that's a great idea and maybe that's something we could do reaching out with one of these uh that's a good idea for reaching out i think um reach out to one of the groups, maybe Sunrise, um, or something identified by uh, Tony, because he's got his pulse on the students too. So he might know a group, a student group that would be really happy to do this, since a lot of our renters are students. Um, yeah, OK, so that's I'm putting big stars next to that to follow up on. Anything else there for the, any other comments or suggestions? If not, let's go on to the solar bylaw. Do we have any updates or anything we need to be doing there yet? I can jump in on this one. Um, so I believe the CRC will once again be um, discussing it on their meeting on April 30th and Chris Brestrup and I are meeting tomorrow to, as I mentioned at the last meeting, try to untease the different parts uh, that are in the current draft of the bylaw 
just for them to review. Um, so what would be language for the actual bylaw, language for the regulations and conditions, special conditions, and just to sort of tease those things out, um, just so they can sort of see what that looks like. So, all right, I'll put that on my April 30th is what day of the week? That's a... I'm going to say Tuesday, maybe? Tuesday, is that right? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's definitely on, Tuesday. I think it's next Tuesday. Yes, it's next Tuesday. So, um, I think that is a... Yes, okay, good. That's a good day. Maybe I can even attend that one. That's uh, And that's the CRC, so I can find their information online. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so go ahead, Dwayne. Well, really, it does not, sorry, it doesn't have to do with the solar bylaw, it's more just solar generally. Go ahead. Um, I just thought I'd mention, and maybe it comes with more of an update, but uh, it seems to fit here, um, that uh, some of you may have heard Massachusetts got, just got awarded two, uh, 156 or something million dollars, um. Uh, uh, from the federal government, along with, I think, 30 other states or or uh, uh, groups of states, uh, $7 billion altogether, uh, specifically from, from the um, uh, Inflation Reduction, uh, IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, I think it is. Um, uh, and it's actually EPA money uh, through the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund uh, to specifically um, support solar for low income, it's, it's the solar for all program, national program, solar for all. Uh, and it's particularly part of Biden's, you know, uh, Justice 40 initiative. Um, and so all essentially all this money is dedicated to increasing access uh, to solar from for uh, from uh, by low income community members. Um, the state's proposal is really geared towards doing that primarily through public housing. Um, 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 uh, agencies and so forth. Um, I don't know all the details about the proposal. That's the main main thrust of it. But there is, and I don't know um, how much of, of uh, sort of public housing, either publicly owned or privately owned, we have in Amherst. Um, but we should keep uh, keep keep our eyes and ears open for that, and the, the town should. Um, and uh, but there's also some monies available that are less uh, a small an undisclosed or undetermined but presumably smaller amount that's uh, available for other um, uh, other other um, initiatives. So I have a question about Justice Forty because there's another uh, thing I was going to mention later that seems to be aimed at Justice Forty communities, and there is a map of Justice 40 communities. And there is not a Justice 40 community in Amherst. Does that mean we are not eligible for any of this money? Um, Northampton. It was by census track. Uh, so it's not community wide. Um, and maybe Stephanie knows, but we certainly certainly have low income pockets. Um, and I think they show up on census tracks as being um, low rank. I don't know. specifically a justice 40 i can use yeah. the link i was i was actually trying to look for this exact information today and i wasn't okay. successful in finding the map so laurie if you have it just can you forward it to me I can but actually um, share it. we um, are so amherst has several environmental justice neighborhoods within our community but that's a state designation this justice 40 is a federal designation, which is different. And if we're not showing up, then that potentially could mean that we're not necessarily able to secure some of these funds. But I would follow up with the state because if the state is implementing this, um, I don't know if that would make a difference. And, I, and I'm not sure whether all the, these monies are limited to Justice 40 communities. Yeah. It may be more to, to low income um, housing or low income individuals, but it may not be limited to uh, Justice 40 communities. Yeah, so this is May 2022, but this is, this I found linked through the other thing I was going to mention, Stephanie, the, um, uh, what was it, the, uh, I don't remember what it was now, there was something else I was going to mention that, that was Justice 40. Oh yeah, it was the uh, workshop coming up on how to access these funds, right? 
Yes. Yeah. You've got a copy of Incentive, but I also got a copy of that from probably through ACEE or something like that. I got it too, and I did sign up. But um, one thing I want to say is that I'm I'm very surprised Amherst doesn't show up because yeah. in the state we actually have we're a community that has actually a fairly large percentage of environmental justice neighborhoods. So mm -hmm. this doesn't totally make sense to me. Um, I don't know what the criteria is, but in any case, I think, no, um, you know, this is one of those things where we'd probably want to do some outreach to the state to find out what's going on. If, if they're administering the funds, which it sounds like they are, yeah. um, I think we would want to follow up with them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's something to put on the agenda to do. Um, are we, are we eligible for justice for the funds at all? Um, Cause according to that map, Northampton, Greenfield are the closest. We don't have anything here. Turner's. Um, all right. Should we move on? Uh, next thing on the list was transportation, which is Tony, but I guess I could ask again, Stephanie, any more news on Valley Bike? Um, I think we're still where we were last time in that um, Northampton is still ironing out the contract with the new vendor. Uh, it is definitely, well, I should say it's very, very likely to be launching again this spring. Uh, the town council did authorize the town manager to sign the memorandum of understanding uh, with Amherst and the other communities to move forward with our program. So uh, that would commit us to at least the first three years. So um, that was all good news. Uh, but but I anticipate we'll be hearing about it fairly soon. Okay. Good. That'd be great. Got a bunch of questions about that at uh, at least two or three people asked about that at the uh, Sustainability Festival. Okay, regional and state policy updates. There were two things. Should, should we move on from there since Tony's not here? Any more transportation stuff? Okay, if not, then uh, regional and state policy updates. There were two things I was going to mention. One of them was a letter that uh, probably should have gotten into the packet. I can share it. It was from Joe Comerford. Uh, to state senator right who um pointing out let me see if i can just find it really quick i think i have it here uh, in which case i can share it oh dang i went away from it um hold on there it is okay so i will just share this and maybe we can uh, afterwards throw it in the packet um where's the share button there it is uh okay so Joe was sent a note to some of her, to all of her constituents, I think, who interact with her on any with any regularity, <laughs> about this first light relicensing of first light hydropower. So these are the folks that run the Northfield Reservoir, which is our local giant hydroelectric battery um, for energy storage. Where they pump water uphill when the when the solar is running and let it run downhill when we need more power. Um, and also the Turner's Falls. Um, hydroelectric, which I didn't realize there were actually working hydroelectric dams there. Um, but I knew there was a dam there. I didn't realize it was actually still functioning, which is great, uh, including one of the ones on the, the um, well, anyway, it's a long story. I won't, won't go into it. But um, there are actually two hydroelectric projects at Turner's Falls. Um, so it would seem obvious that relicensing them is very important. But on the other hand, there are environmental impacts of these things that the local folks have been worried about for years. And there is going to be, um, there are gonna be hearings coming up. I think I had my timing wrong on this. There is a, um, the, the application was just filed this week for re-permitting. And that is going to this, in the timeline that strikes off like a 60 day period. There's a, there's a public comment period, but there's also gonna be a bunch of public hearings on the topic. But if you wanna get a word in early, which I would encourage everyone to do, um, there is a, let's see if I can find it. Um, there is a place you can go. That's the first light, that's the timeline. How to file a comment. So this FERC.gov how to file a comment is where you wanna go. Um, and you can file a comment any time now, but in particular, I think for the first 60 days, there'll probably be a specific link for this project at some point. 
but this is how you file a comment. So I think what I'd like to do, Stephanie, is after the meeting, just send um, this link and the Joe Comerford note to everyone in ECAC and to put it in the packet uh, so that folks who want to file a comment can. Because, it, you know, like I say, they, they have done, apparently First Light has done a lot of work to try to mitigate a lot of the concerns. I don't know how effective those are. I don't know how hard they actually worked on it. I haven't looked at the report. They have like 122 page report on all the stuff they've done, but I, I don't know how sincere an effort it was. I hope it was sincere um, because it's really important that this get relicensed. So that's my two cents on that. Any comments on that? Anyone have any insight or other? Um, information on this. And the sorts of things they're interested in or worried about are environmental impacts to the fishery, to the banks, erosion on the banks of the river. Uh, Northfield has gotten different. I, I remember hearing some debate about Northfield. I don't recall exactly what it was um, in the past. But at any rate, that's something to keep our eyes on. And if Joe Comerford is writing to us about it, it probably means there's going to be interesting views, <laughs> lots of diverse views. And she wants us to know about it, um, that this is going to be there. Uh, OK, the other thing, what was the other thing? Um, didn't write it down. What was the other thing that just came across today, Stephanie? It just came across today. It was, oh yeah, the uh, information. Um, let me see if I can find that. This, um, Steve sent a copy of it to Stephanie. Um, I did forward it to everybody. You did forward it to everybody? Okay, so that's the residential ret for retrofits for energy equity which I've already put on my calendar and registered for, that's on Tuesday, May 21st, there's going to be a workshop on it. But again, this is for Justice 40 community. I didn't realize it was Justice 40 communities until I clicked through and registered because it, um, yeah, because it doesn't say that in the in the note that's that we got, in the email we got, but it does when you register for it, say for Justice 40 communities. So again, it makes me wonder if we're eligible, but that's something again to ask. I signed well, up we, anyway, um, uh, so I can investigate, but I signed up anyway. Good, okay, yep. All right, and those are the two things I had for this week. Um, I'll try to keep doing that. Anyone else have any other local or regional updates that we should know about? Go ahead, Dwayne. Um, I guess two, um, uh, and I think it goes here as opposed to the uh, member updates. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so as you, you may remember um, the clean energy extension uh, along with um, Senator Comerford and uh, Rep Dom um, hosted the uh, solar forum um, back in October. October, I think it was, and then the final one was, I think, in December, or maybe January. But uh, that was part one, <laughs> and uh, now we're um, we're looking uh, to do a part two, uh, uh, and it's been prompted, um, particularly to do it fairly soon, uh, and to focus it on the recent recommendations that came out from the um, citing. Commission, um, I forget the full name of the citing commission, um, but a long name, but basically about uh, citing um, recommendations with regard to citing renewable energy facilities in Massachusetts. Um, our focus would be more on solar uh, in, in Western Massachusetts. Um, both the Senator and the representative were very interested in holding this solar forum um, in May, we backed it down. We backed it to early June, um, in order to have a conversation and gain insights, feedback, perspectives from the community, um, so that they have sufficient opportunity to 
uh, weigh in and influence uh, legislation uh, that is ongoing now uh, and will be tied up at the end of the legislative season session, uh, which I think is the uh, in July. Uh, but um, bills language is being worked on right now. They're like apparently they're in the budget and there's something else they're dealing with. So they don't we'd have to do it right away. But we, we're sort of uh, just mentioned we're, we're scheduling this for early June. I don't have a, a firm date yet, uh, but we'll obviously let folks know. Um, and um, um, uh, um, yeah, and it is really about the solar and, and solar siting issues and, and the recommendations of the siting commission uh, to focus on that, which I think we discussed in an earlier um, one of these meetings, ECAC meeting. But I'll pe keep people uh, informed about that. Thank you, Dwayne. That's great. Yeah, that first one was marvelous. <laughs> the first Part well, I, <laughs> the second one uh, is not going to be a, a, a whole series. <laughs> uh, we're looking to do this in one day, uh, um, either either three quarters of a day, uh, maybe a full day, um, and a bit more. Uh, the first one was the first sessions were more learning. Uh, mm -hmm. This is going to be a bit more um, directed about the uh, commission uh, and just uh, in some venue some discussion and feedback ability to, to provide some feedback to the um rep and the and the senator right and, and potentially other legislators that might be on there as well mm -hmm. all right what was the second thing you said there were two yeah and i'm happy to hold it for updates because it's not as uh it's not really state policy or regional right. policy yeah but Okay, then for updates. Um, we're almost there anyway. So uh, Laura's not here. So unless someone else has something to say about network geothermal, let's move on to the sustainability festival recap. Um, yeah. Did you want to start that, Laurie, or did you want me to? Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Stephanie. It's your, it's your um, baby. Yeah, no, I, I think it was a really fantastic event this year. The weather, of course, being 95% of its success always. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always great uh, now that, well, this has been consistent for a while, but having the event at the, on the same day that the farmer's market starts, the two events really mm -hmm. help populate one another. And it seemed to work really well this year. Um, we had more town departments represented than we have in the past. And I've checked in with many of them and they said it was really great for them to be there. They had really wonderful conversations. Um, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. Right. Um, I know, I wish I had thought to do that. I have a bunch of pictures as well. Um, I hope you got your little booth too. I have one of you at the booth. Yeah, yeah I got this one here. Anyway, um, <laughs> great. Yeah, we had, um, we had a lot of amazing conversations with people. Uh, there were two solar companies represented. PV Squared has been with us every single year, even since we were doing a renewable energy fair. For this, this is their 16th year that they actually were present at our event. So I really, and they're always enthusiastic. They always love it. They're always enthusiastic. So um, really always happy to have PV Squared with us. But then we also had... Um, revision which was sunbug solar who actually did a presentation for us they were actually there as well so that was nice to have them there um and then we had some advocacy groups we had some student groups sunrise was there sunrise got three new members julian was very happy <laughs> that he had three new members sign up mm -hmm. um i don't know if it was the amar shade tree committee but they got a hundred people on their mailing list wow. so it just seemed like there was a lot of really great communication and community engagement that happened this year. I mean, I think it happens every year, but this year there seemed to be more sort of town specific engagement, which was really great, you know, with town departments, town committees, um, the energy and climate action committee, obviously you all being there, plus the shade tree committee also always being there is really great. People have an opportunity to, to connect directly with those two, with your committees. And they give um, away trees. And, and they give away trees. Pumps. <laughs> so yeah well <laughs> if we could that would be great but um no it was I mean from my perspective I think it was a really successful 
event and people are excited about doing it again next year. So next year's event is going to be on Saturday, April 26th, 2025. Mark it down. <laughs> I've already sent out the save the date. So yeah. yeah, and I had, like I say, a nonstop stream of people, mostly one at a time, but uh, it was very hard for me to get a break. Um, and I did get uh, comments from from 15 different, uh, I, I took, I took na 15 different names down and people I want to get back to um, who were looking for help and who I referred for heat pump help uh, elsewhere. Uh, let me see, is there anything else I wanted to, I had made some notes. Um, uh, other highlights, I spoke with Tim Fay, who lives at Sirius Co-housing, who is touting rocket stoves, which I'd never heard about, so I learned all about rocket stoves. I don't think they're a replacement for heat pumps, but they do have the advantage of not having a lot of embodied carbon. They're made out of, uh, uh, his concern was embodied carbon and uh, how much embodied carbon and how much environmental damage goes into building a heat pump versus building a uh, something like a rocket stove, a very efficient wood stove, basically. Um, out of clay, <laughs> clay, clay brick. Um, and uh, spoke with, uh, met some faculty at UMass who do sustainable chemistry and spoke with three different people about interesting heat problems at their housing, in their housing situation. Um, and I've got names and addresses of all the, or addresses anyway of the housing um, complexes. Um, and a note to reach out to at least one of them. So uh, yeah, it's it was a it was a very interesting and productive I think um, day. Uh, and I had somebody there. Thank you to Tony. Big thank you to Tony and Michael who aren't here, um, and to Steve who who I was was not there. I was there the whole day myself, but I, there was always somebody else there. So, um, and in particular, when Tony and Michael were there was when I managed to get one decent break. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a good day. I can only report apologies for not being there. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I missed, we, I missed it. It worked. <laughs> and we now have an ECAC banner too that I had printed up, so. <laughs> um, all right, let's see what's next. My notes. Um, it's staff updates. Staff updates. Okay, why don't we go to staff updates then? Sure. So, as Laurie mentioned, um, I had a meeting with the comptroller and the procurement officer regarding the heat pump RFP to maybe tighten it up about a bit. Um, we did take out the piece of having the the vendor actually be the one to oversee like the um, community outreach for the education and uh, community captains. We we kind of felt like that might be above and beyond um, their capability, and so instead we sort of asked them to maybe just do one training session with the community members at the end of their efforts. So it will be a two year program. It has to be completed. It absolutely has to be done and all everything expended by December of 2026 because we we're using ARPA funds. So the term of their contract is actually going to be till November 30th, just to make sure that we don't miss that mark because it's imperative uh, that that be wrapped up by the end of December. So it will be um, probably getting into the, the RFP will being released into the paper May 1st. Uh, will be when it gets submitted. I think May 6th is when it actually gets advertised. So I will certainly update you when I know the exact dates of that. But I did my edits, um, sent them on to Lori, who is now looking at them. They weren't extensive, but there were just some things to sort of tighten it up a bit. Um, so nothing changed really drastically uh, other than sort of taking out that that piece of the community programming. But there is still community outreach that they would be required to do as just part of the initiative, very similar to the Solarize campaign. Um, Stephanie, one thing before you go on to the next update, if there is a next one, one thing I realized I forgot to mention that's very important that staff updates made me remember is that I did talk to a lot of people about the CCA and I think others did too. Uh, Steve, did you talk to anyone about it? No? 
because I, I, okay, I talked to a lot of people about it just because they asked, well, what's ECAC? And so I'd bring up things like the CCA and a lot of people, the people I spoke with, not one of them knew about energyswitchmass.gov. Not, not one of them knew they could pick their provider. So um, that was interesting. Don't, don't tell them now. <laughs> I know. It's like, Lord, that's, <laughs> well, this is not the time we want them to be doing that. I know. I know. But they were excited. <laughs> they were excited about, about, well, I thought they should know about it, but they should also know about the CCA and about the advantages of it. So I made a big point of that. Yeah, they yeah. will know. But the thing, so the thing is, I mean, and certainly. No, if, they're on, if they're on energy switch, they have to opt in. I get that. Yes. Yeah. So they're, they're you know, they will certainly be. They will certainly be um, informed of what their all of their options, yeah. but yeah. anyone who is currently an Eversource consumer on the basic or customer that's on the basic service will automatically get opted into our CCA, yeah. and they will have to opt out. I'm saying this for the benefit of education to those yeah. who may be watching this later, um, and they yeah. will then have yeah. to. Um, opt out if they don't want to continue. Um, but we have an incredibly wonderful um, yeah. consultant who has a lot of experience uh, with working Mass Power Choice, has a lot of experience with working with Massachusetts communities, and they're very good at sort of lining up a really great opportunity for us. There is yeah. absolutely no guarantee that it will be a better rate, but certainly our provider will do their best to find us good rates. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, that will all, all of that information will be coming out soon. The, as I mentioned at the last meeting, the CCA was approved by DPU. Mass Power Choice is just finalizing some contract language. Uh, we will be meeting with them soon. I haven't scheduled the meeting yet, but it will probably be within the next week or two. Um, we expect that the program will officially launch in the fall. Right. So it's going to take a while for some things to line up before right. it gets officially launched in the fall. Yeah, and that's what I what I told folks. Go ahead, Dwayne. Uh, just a question for Stephanie: is 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 there still a plan to have an opt up option for greener option? I believe there will be. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to just encourage is that it, it is. A serious concern for a lot of people how high electric bills are. So I would really, really hope that the base rate, while also being slight, at least slightly greener than Eversources, really, I hope, needs to be a little less expensive. Because right now, Eversource is the most expensive. If you go on Energy Switch right now, it's 15 cents, 15.7, I think. And you can get greener, greener energy, meaning Rex in Texas. Windrex in Texas uh, for 10 cents. So that's a big difference. And, uh, you know, we do have a lot of low income folks and I I really wanna see the CCA succeed, but I don't wanna see folks have to pay a lot more than they than they would otherwise, so. Well, I think that's the goal. I mean, I, that's yeah. totally the goal, Lori. Yeah. I, and then, and the reason why I repeated everything that I did, and I know that's probably yeah. what you tell people at the festival, but yeah. I wanted to make sure that information was here in case yeah. anyone's watching this recording. Exactly. I just wanted to repeat all that information for their benefit. Yeah. Um, but and yeah, I mean, that's the goal. Yeah. And and I want folks to also know that those Windrex in Texas, that that greener, apparently greener energy, you know, pays for is not the same, you know, you're paying for Windrex in Texas versus presumably with the CCA, you would be paying for actual green energy development in Massachusetts or locally. Um, and that's a big difference right there. Right. Actually doing something to green the grid with your with your hard-earned money instead of sending it to pay for Windrex in Texas. <laughs> yep. um, and then I think I already updated you oh, before I move on. Go ahead, Don. I know there's going to be a lot of um, information on the um, CCA. Um, what I'm particularly interested in is what happens to people who generate power and send it to Eversource? Do you mean those who have solar? Yeah. They, that's still, uh, those people will still be able to be part of the program. I, I don't, I think, again, if if, because they're being still billed through Eversource. So I think they will still be part of the program. Um, okay. Yeah. 
I don't mean to be difficult, but what happens no. if you haven't gotten a bill in four years from Eversource? Well, I mean, I think, right. yeah, I think that we can, we can answer all of those questions. Okay. That's getting into the weeds right now. Good. And part of the reason I don't, because I don't know, I mean, I don't have the answer exactly at this moment, but also, I mean, I think we need to wait until we actually find who we're sourcing our power from and sure. all those details will be ironed out. So I don't even want to say anything now that might change down the road. So I'm um, save those details for later. So just know that they're coming. It's yeah, coming. With community solar, there's basically no difference. It doesn't matter who your provider is. You'll still get your discount. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Same idea. So um, moving on, I did mention bike share. Um, so the town is authorized to sign the MOU. We are moving forward with that program. The vendor has been identified and is in negotiation and contract under contract with Northampton that's being finalized. So hoping that that will launch sooner than later, certainly within, you know, I would hope by mid May, end of May, that I'm hoping to hear that we'll be officially launching once again at that time. So that's moving forward. Um, talked about heat pumps. So community choice aggregation, we covered that. Um, so I think those are kind of the big, big items right now. I did mention before that we got a Meta grant for $15,000 for technical assistance to look at town hall and the feasibility of um, getting off fossil fuels, going from an oil system to heat pump technology. Um, we had some things about weatherization that has to get looked at for our roof which is going to be very costly. So that's moving forward. Um, so there's uh, some other things in the works, but nothing that I would necessarily report out specifically on yet. Oh, but the last thing I did want to say is that we do have our fellow identified for this summer who is going to do a fleet vehicle greenhouse gas emissions inventory, which has been long in coming. Um, her name is Honey Gala, and she will be with us uh, at the end of May, beginning of June through mid August. Just Very a spelling on her, her name, just for the minute, so if you want the, it in the minutes. Sure. First name is Honey, and last name is uh, Gala, as in the Apple G A L A. G A L A? Correct. Okay. Is there an apple? <laughs> Okay, I guess <laughs> there is. You, I thought it was a party. Okay. No, okay. no, <laughs> no. There's also. I thought. <laughs> I thought <laughs> apple. You thought party. <laughs> that's a. That's a gala. That's a gala. 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 Potato. Potato. <laughs> yeah. Um. So anyway, yeah. That's. I think the majority of the updates that I have for today. Okay. Member updates. Uh, can I just? Yeah. No. Oh, no well, I just. Uh. Just. And sorry to back up just very quickly, Stephanie, just for reasonable reading of the minutes. Uh, we talked about the RFP at the beginning. Uh, remind me, is this an, an, an it came from an Empower grant, if I recall? Or the, I'm sorry, the RFP for the, for the, the two year, I think, heat pump program? Heat pump, it's ARPA. It's ARPA funding. Okay. That we're utilizing okay. for that program. Yep. Yeah, okay. Okay. And you mentioned uh, and that I will. Okay. I did want to just say, and something you should probably add is that our outreach will be targeted to low income residents for the heat pump program. Okay. And you mentioned that you were meeting with the controller and, and somebody else? The procurement officer. <laughs> to, yeah. Okay. To sort of um, tighten up the language. So, yeah. Okay. All right, we can continue then. Thank you. All right, uh, member updates. Anyone have an update? Um, I will if nobody else has. I'm trying to finish typing though. Um, but yeah, okay. So um, I got a um, reference from um, a Ted Mendoza, uh, who you may know. He's he's a facilities person at. UMass, who's uh, in planning, who's kind of the um, main guy um, work, working on the um, university's clean energy transition, uh, based on a on a presentation that he's done um, over the over the last year on on the plan for the university, he got 
an inquiry from a person from Applewood Housing, Senior Housing, I think it is. Um, I know it's down in uh, Steve's neck of the woods, maybe other, and and, uh, and Don's too, um, down South Amherst across this across uh, Bay Road, I guess, from uh, Ham Hampshire College. Uh, I don't know the facility that well, uh, but they were, th this person was uh, stated that there was some interest. I don't know if whether it's just his interest or whether there was actual conversations within the community uh, about um, transitioning themselves um, to um, net zero. Uh, they were intrigued with the, um, you know, what UMass was doing with regard to geothermal wells and thought that might be appropriate. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the community that well uh, in terms of geo uh, uh, how it's laid out in terms of whether that might make sense uh, or or straight up heat, uh, air source heat pumps for the units. I, I don't know how it's set up, uh, but I was wondering whether um, anybody has insights into Applewood or would want to uh, join me in just introducing ourselves as ECAC. We're here to help, listen, um, and um, um, uh, um, um, provide any information and, and see where it may go. I think, you know, if it goes somewhere, then maybe there's an opportunity to um, help them out with a, a, a student or something to, to, to work on, work with them uh, on this. Um, but I thought it would be appropriate maybe for, um, uh, for ECAC to um, at least introduce themselves to to the to this person and maybe to the community. Yeah, I would I would love to do that. I would be willing to to do that with you, Dwayne, um, or just do it. Um, they so they're a fairly sprawling community. They have a they have a central building for entertaining and you know events, and then they have an an eating. I think they have a dining hall there too. I'm not sure. And they then they have like garden apartments, and I think even single family homes cottages and garden apartments and and uh, and uh, different types of units spread around a fairly sprawling campus. So I think I would think geothermal would be an option. Mm -hmm. um, a, a big network, you know, big. And are they a nonprofit? I think Applewood might be a nonprofit. Uh, I remember looking into this at one point. Um, I think they're. Uh... I, I would, I would caution this group from becoming a consultant. No, just giving, just talking um, to them about that, it. That's, uh, I mean, to, that's a, that's a that's a huge statement that you just made. Geothermal yeah. might be an option. I, I think a comprehensive feasibility study that study, looks yeah. at the perfect right. maintenance, envelope, roofs, everything, ventilation loads, sure. water management. Yeah. This is big. And I think we need to be careful as a group. I think I think connecting them to, to design professionals. Yeah. This is much bigger yep. than mm -hmm. single family home yeah. energy retrofits. This is a big deal. And and I would be very careful about making broad statements like that. Um it may it's possible, but but I think I would just uh I would I would I would before meeting with them, I would maybe Think about what what's being delivered, what you're offering, and you know, it, it would be you know, typically a job like this would involve a team of mechanical engineers, yeah. architects, etc. It's a commercial property. It's a whole different set of rules. It, 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 it's you know, a nonprofit. Just, so so yes, they, it's a nonprofit. It's commercial, but it's a nonprofit, right? Yeah, the nonprofit is irrelevant when it comes to building code and right, uh, but not for funding, which is why. Sure, I sure, yeah, no, and I think that's that's the area where I would. That's a great focus there, but technical advice. I don't think anyone here is qualified. No, I I'm going to say it very clearly. Well, I think but we're I think qualified to say back up <laughs> yeah. uh, you need to hire some professionals uh here's, yeah. some, here's some options we're aware of but it's really a prof you know this is a, a scale that requires a, a professional a professional yes. uh, and and um uh um but the funding stream like you said Laura, yeah funding streams grant opportunities that kind of thing awesome love it well the thing that made me think that is is the uh laura's 
interest in, you know, pointed out to us that there's a, there's money available for network geothermal. So it's it, not saying that they could do it. I don't have any idea. I'm not, you know, it's not my expertise, but there's a lot of different possibilities for them and money available and probably even money available to do a study would be my guess. So, yeah. Yeah. That would be, um, I, I gives me an excuse to learn what the uh, resources are for nonprofits. I know I look pretty funny because- <laughs> You're checkered. Totally. Cool. Checkered. <laughs> I threw a quilt, a, a blanket up on the window so I wouldn't get direct sunlight in my face. And now I look like I have some weird disease. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So uh, uh, yeah, that's I'd be that'd be interesting, Dwayne. I to find out, you know, I, I feel like all of this is is learning curve yeah. for me in finding out what help is available. That's the main thing I'm interested in is figuring out where to send them and what to. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me ask. I mean, uh, I, I'm happy to reach out to this person. I do have their. E I don't know know him, but I have his email now. Um, and, um, um, I can offer to have a conversation with, uh, with, with him, uh, visit maybe with the community. Um, mm -hmm. Laura, you'd be interested in joining in on yeah. that. Yeah. Um, Jesse is a building professional. <laughs> would you, um, you know, obviously as a, as a ECAC member, um, would you I want think... to be part of that to offer that type of, of, um, sage adv advice and, 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 um, Potentially, not only caution, but just process that they would go through. Yeah, as a as an ECAC member, not as a building professional, yeah. I would say I think those have to be. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. many for many reasons. Um, the other thing I think just could be um, really valuable is help. You know, even precedent. There might be precedents out there of RFPs to do this work that are um, yeah, okay. yeah, right. in the public um realm for this scale of project there's a, there's plenty of plenty of people have asked this question before um and that that really typically well that's one of the early pieces is a, a request for either qualifications or proposals I, I can guess that the first thing they're going to have to do if they haven't already done it is called just from what i've learned about this condo association that had been question that I got at uh, the sustainability festival, I can guess that they're going to be, there is a, um, a mass save branch that works specifically with multifamily housing and they're gonna have to get a uh, assessment through them. So that's something we could just point out to them right away. They almost certainly have to start there no matter what they do, if they wanna be eligible for anything. Mm -hmm. And I can point them to that immediately. And Stephanie, do we have any limitations on on uh, the three of us um, meeting with such an entity as as ECAC? Well, then, if you're again, remember, yeah, once you have sort of a specific focus and you say three of us are going to do this together, yeah, uh -oh. then it becomes sort of like a subcommittee meeting, or you know, so we want to be careful about that. Um, also. I wanted to point out that one of the things that you might be directing them to do, not a request for proposals, but a request for information, would be a way in which they could reach out to professionals who do this type of work mm -hmm. to get information about what it would entail to do it, how much it might cost. Um, that's kind of what we did with the bike share program. And we got, I think, six responses from different mm -hmm. entities that laid out, and it was a, a range of possibility, really, um, and cost. So that's kind of one of the things that they want to do is just to get information, just to find out. So it's not going to really cost them anything except a bit of time to put something like that together. And maybe that's where you all could really be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I would caution, you know, just in terms of what you're directing them to do, more just in helping them get the information to consider these things might be mm -hmm. more the way you want to go well right. that's i think that's a great idea stephanie i'm also curious um there's something i'm not sure if it makes sense. like there's lots of groups out there 
in Amherst and otherwise, why would our resources go specifically towards one? Um, would it make sense potentially to find, you know, to, to leverage this as a um, more of an education event and have a, a Q and A with professionals about doing this kind of work and invite, you know, um, other similar organizations, leadership from others. Is that too big of a thing? <laughs> No, I mean, I, well, it's a big thing to do, but but not impossible. And I don't think that's a bad idea. I'm so if you do a request for information, it's just from a bunch of different companies. So you're not targeting any one specific. You're just getting information from a bunch of different firms to understand what are the possibilities. How would they do this? What would they do? What would they charge? It's just really an information gathering, and that's why it's a request for information. It's just um, so it would be from multiple different companies and entities. And from that, you might then want to take, ask those folks who submitted information to maybe do some kind of um, information session, you know, that you would do a public, maybe via Zoom or something, um, information asking, session. Are we asking for this information or is Apple would asking for No, this? Apple would, would be the ones, but you would, you could be helping them put together to the proposal. put together the, the request for information. Maybe you mm -hmm. could be helping them you know, to identify the things, especially, you know, Jesse, with your background, Dwayne, Laurie, you know, what are the things they'd be looking for? You know, because when you submit a request for information, you are outlining the things you're looking to get answered and what you're looking for them to submit. So you all could be really enormously helpful that way and helping them hone that in. Yeah. Yeah. And I just keeping in mind that, yeah, that next step, it's, this is a repeating typology all over uh the country for that mm. matter there are a lot of these things and uh to make that to have the result be a more like sort of available to any um similar facility i think would really be i think that would be more in line with what we do rather than you know, taking well, maybe, our resources for a single organization yeah, I, I agree and we don't want to become as jesse says a consultant for applewood um and I, I wouldn't even offer to write the RFI, maybe, you know, review, you know, talk to them about the types of things and then offer to maybe review what they put together. But I'm also thinking of it, maybe it is, you know, let them know that from our perspective, we're looking at this as a pilot opportunity to work with a, a, um, a, a facility, a, 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 you know, multifamily unit facility in, in Amherst. And we would be keen on, on, um, seeing how we can replicate uh this effort and make it a bit more um available you know any any outputs in terms of like a, an rfi that we we would be keen on on making that available to other um um similar facilities in in amherst uh and maybe also um run a educational uh series uh, or session later on how um, how if, how multifamily units could put something like this together. I wonder if there is a example RFI or RFP out there somewhere. I would think there is. Yeah, I, I would think so too. Yeah. This sounds really interesting. So how do we proceed, Stephanie, if we can't three of us go over there and talk to them? What should we what what would you say? I think Dwayne brought this to the table, so maybe Dwayne follows mm -hmm. up. And I think um, where you can support is maybe in terms of if you're either looking to provide some information they might want to include. And I would, the way I envision this is that Jesse or Lori, you could sort of funnel that information to Dwayne and he could submit it all to them, you know. But in terms of Dwayne's point, you all wouldn't write it up for them, but. Right you know, just sort of getting them things that they should be looking for, you all could supply information through Duane. Yeah, but ultimately we probably do want to, you know, I'd, I'd certainly be willing and interested to meet with them, you know, probably in person at the facility uh, or by Zoom. Um, if, if we get one more person, do we have a question? <laughs> well, what I think you should, what I would recommend is actually maybe have this as an agenda item and have them come to your meeting. 
no. rather no, than okay. rather okay. than yeah. mm -hmm. doing some kind of subcommittee outreach, which doesn't really make sense to me. Better to have okay. them because this would be in, of interest to the community, okay. you know. And great. also, if you're trying to make this something that would be replicable, replicable or relevant to other housing complexes. And I think this is a way to, to make sure that you have the information captured. So, so that's a great that would idea. be my recommendation. That's mm -hmm. a great idea. Why don't we invite them to the next meeting if possible? And meanwhile, I'm going to, I'll do, you know, I'll come with a link or two for them for, I'm just wondering if they even have Matt Save out there yet. And if not, I can give them a link or two there. Um, Laura might have some funding opportunities she wants to let them know about, just so they know about things that are available. Um, I can, we can also let them know about, you know, whatever's available through MassSafe. So I think this is, I think this is great. I think we should All right, let me, this is, uh, let me just cl clarify. This is a bit of a, of a, um, I, I don't, I'm not sure how recently Ted Mendoza and, um, Right. This person have, have communicated. So I don't I, I let's not anticipate this will be next meeting. OK, um, I think I'll reach out uh, to him and introduce myself, ECAC, yep. my role um, and see and, and see where things stand. Maybe it maybe it's like, yeah, they're not interested anymore. <laughs> or maybe it's just, this, you know, one person. He hasn't talked to anybody else in the community yet. Um, uh, but let me let mention uh, talk to him or, or you know, email him and let him yep. know that that ECAC would be we we would think that it would, you know coming to an ECAC meeting uh, and talking about this and and us sharing our um thoughts uh on it um would be a, a good first step uh yeah, and that we could do that in in the uh sometime in the next couple of months really be great for the larger community too so yep. yeah yeah okay and just let us know when you know all right cool okay any other member updates? In that case, I think we should uh, set items to the next agenda. I think this is sort of the, out, the outline we use today, except for the sustainability festival, I think we'll pretty much stay with those topics and see where it takes us um, when, if this thing works out with uh, with uh, Applewood, they should definitely go on as an, as an agenda item. Um, what else is there that should go on? Anyone have anything specific that we know needs to be on there? Otherwise, we will just keep on with this basic agenda, and we certainly seem to have a lot to talk about um, and do. <laughs> All right, then, if nothing else, it's time for public comments. And Martha has her hand up. Martha, you can unmute. Okay. All right. Thank you, Laurie. And I would I'd like to say a little clarification about Apple Board, tell you at least what I know. And then uh, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Dwayne a little bit about the upcoming Solar Forum. So, so first about Applewood, uh, the Applewood, the big Applewood building where um, various seniors have apartments is, is completely separate from all the other dwellings in that whole neighborhood. So I think we're talking just about the, the Applewood large building where seniors you know, yeah. have their apartments and not about all the other housing in in that whole neighborhood okay so i wondered laurie I, it sounded like you were thinking both yeah i think applewood has both i think it has yeah, but it's not, it, i don't think it's under the organization called applewood because the other people own their homes or own their condos and so on yeah it's different yeah i, I think i think i, it is different. I think this was the cl yeah. the, the, cl the the cluster of multifamily units um uh not not the broader neighborhood i i i think that goes by a similar name i think but um I, i'm i'm i'll okay. clarify that with this person i mean that'd be a whole different yeah. story in terms of of uh what would be needed um and if if um district heating would make sense there but the, this i think it's a clustered multifamily 
senior living um, facility. And so they are in process right now of, of expanding it. They've got a big uh, building under construction, as Steve oh. probably seen there. <laughs> and uh, it was originally, at least, it was a group of residents who were concerned and wanted to see if Applewood could do anything to, uh, you know, reduce their energy and, uh, you know, get greener and so on. So I don't know whether the inquiry uh, that uh, Ted received was simply from one of, of that small group of residents or whether they've uh, gone forward farther. So originally it was a group of residents who wanted some information. And if they felt they got enough information, then they could approach the, the management and see if the larger Applewood organization could be persuaded to be interested. And so that's where getting information about what is it the PACE program now that's available for, for nonprofits or, or the kind of funding available uh, might be helpful. So the first thing is to find out whether it's just this small group of residents that are curious or whether it is now grown to something larger. And then they do have Saturday morning talks on a whole variety of subjects for for all of the residents who are interested. And so, you know, a possibility for you folks to think about uh, could be uh, to have one or two of you uh, talk at one of their Saturday morning talks on an, in a general way about the kinds of opportunities there are and so on. So uh, I think that maybe clarifies clarifies that, but it is just that larger building. And unfortunately, probably the new construction has gone too far to be able to influence that and get them to uh, include some uh, greener energy in their structure. I, I don't know where that stands, but yeah. Okay. Okay. So about the uh, the the solar forum, Dwayne, I'm quite interested in. I think that's great that you're going to be doing another session. In that report on the siting and so on, one thing I was disappointed was that they did not emphasize very much the need for planning the expansion of the electrical grid. I mean, as one of the things that we learned in our solar bylaw working group was that one of the challenges for a developer is the huge cost with linking up for the system. What was it, a million dollars a mile that they would have to pay Eversource in order to get the three-phase transmission? And so that forces a developer to have to have a very large installation in order to make a profit and make it worthwhile. And if we want to be able to you know, have smaller installations, say, you know, five and 10 acres or whatever, uh, and still have it make financial sense, the, the network needs to be improved. And I was hoping that that report would say more about the network planning. And I'm wondering, Dwayne, whether it would be possible to have one of the talks be from by somebody who could talk about the, the whole plan for the, you know, expanding the electrical network, uh, the challenges or the or the hopes or the planning status or something like that. I, I, I think that could be quite interesting and informative. All right, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank and, you, Martha. And, 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 and also then it would be great to have one of the legislators who is actually uh, writing the the bills that are being considered of you know who's going to be responsible for uh, permitting the solar and so on I, I think it would be great to have the key legislators be present you know, they could speak about what they're proposing and then also listen to all the various points of view in in the in, in that day I think that would be very helpful too Yeah. So those are my two thoughts on that. <laughs> okay, Steve, do you have something you want to say? Yeah, just one comment. There's, <clears throat> Martha, there's also a clean energy transmission working group, the CETWG, of course. Uh-huh. 
Um, <laughs> now that may not be, so that that's working. So it may be that this clean energy infrastructure group didn't cover transmission because it's being covered in this other working group. I, uh -huh. I don't know, but if you aren't aware of the clean energy transmission working group, they have been having meetings and I believe are making recommendations to the governor. Uh, to, maybe they are, are. Will they be included then in your forum, Dwayne? Do you think? Or, uh, um, to the extent that there's overlap, um, yes. But um, uh, I'm not as familiar with that working group. Yeah, I, I just know that when they have the public listening sessions for the siting commission, the 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 problems of 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 planning of expanding the the grid and how that you know, linked in with, okay, where are you going to put your big solar arrays? That that there was that discussion. And uh, so it is, I do think it is relevant because if you're uh, planning where you're going to site your arrays, you, you need to know uh, what your connection is going to be and, you know, where, so. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Martha, as yeah. always. <laughs> Very much appreciated. So with that, if there are no other things, anything we've missed, uh, I think we can adjourn. Thanks, Thank everybody. You, everyone. Favorite? Yep. Thanks, All right. Thank you. Take Have care. Good night. Yep. Good night. Take care. Bye. <laughs>